Okay. So tonight's presentation is Holiday Gifts for Amateur Radio Operators. I'm Anthony K8ZT. And as usual, when I do a presentation, there's a ton of links in it. So you're going to want this shortcut, tiny.cc slash ARGIFS. And I'll give it a couple times during the presentation. Also, anytime you see this little link symbol, that means that there's a link in the presentation. Plus, all the books and other items in the presentation have links on them that, uh, for you to click so you can find them. There's also some other resources I'll be talking about tonight that are also listed here on this slide. So again, tiny.cc slash ARGIFTS. So tonight's presentation is not just for Christmas, but gifts for any holiday or occasion. It's not a buying list. It's more of an idea guide to get you started. It's not meant as an endorsement of any one product, manufacturer, or vendor. So even though I might give some specific examples or photos, that's not saying that that's the one you need to go out and buy. I'm just giving more or less ideas. Now, there are a couple things where there's only one available uh, in that particular category. So, of course, that will narrow it down. We'll talk about a number of different categories tonight, radios, antennas, station accessories, uh, some tools, some personalized gifts, uh, membership and subscriptions, test equipment, and miscellaneous. But before we do that, let's start off with a little bit of ham entertainment. Twas the night before Christmas, and all through two meters, not a signal was keying up any repeaters. The antennas reached up from the tower quite high to catch the weak signals that bounced from the sky. The children, technicians, took their HTs to bed and dreamed of the day they'd be extras instead. Mom put on her headphones, I plugged in the key, and we tuned 40 meters for that rare ZK3. When the meter was pegged by a signal with power, it smoked a small diode and I swear shook the tower. Mom yanked off her phones and with all she could muster, logged a spot of that signal on the DX packet cluster. While well, I ran to the window and peered up at the sky to see what could generate RF that high. It was way in the distance, but the moon made it gleam. A flying sleigh with an eight element beam. And a little old driver, it was too far to tell, but he might have been sent by the ARRL. Then I saw it was Santa. The Santa of hams, on a mission this Christmas to clean up the bands. He circled the tower, then stopped in his track, and he slid down the coax right into the shack. While Mom and I hid behind stacks of CQ, this Santa of hamming knew just what to do. He cleared off the shack desk of paper and parts and filled out all my late QSLs for a start. He ran copper braid, took a steel rod, and pounded it into the earth till the station was grounded. He tightened loose fittings, resoldered connections, cranked down modulation, installed lightning protection. He neutralized tubes in my linear amp. Never worked right before, now it works like a champ. A new low-pass filter cleaned up the TV. He corrected the settings in my TNC. He repaired the computer that wouldn't compute and he backed up the hard drive and got it to boot. Then he reached really deep in the bag that he brought and he pulled out a big box. A new rig, I thought, a new Kenwood, an ICOM, a Yesu for me? An Alicraft, Tentec, or Flex, could it be? If he thought I'd been bad, it might be QRP. Yes, the ultimate station. How could I deserve this? Could be all those weekends I worked public service. He hooked it all up and in record time, quickly worked 100 countries, all down on 160. I should have been happy it was my call, he said, but the cards and the postage will cost a month's rent. He made final adjustments and left a card by the key to Gary from Santa Claus, 73. Then he grabbed his HT, looked me straight in the eye, punched a code on the pad, and was gone. No goodbye. I ran back to the station, and the pileup was big, but a card from St. Nick would be worth my new rig. Oh, too late, for his final came over the air. It was copied all over. It was heard everywhere. The ham Santa exclaimed what an old ham expects. Merry Christmas to all, and to all. Good DX. Okay, so let's uh, talk a little about some gifts now. 
So the first thing I want to talk about is politely suggesting gifts that you want. If you haven't gotten this down yet, you've probably got a bunch of gag gifts like the little Santa's outhouse here that uh, has sound to it. I, I did not save the sound on this slide, but he has annoying comments he makes from inside the shaking outhouse. So um, some suggestions. Have the signif your significant other watch this presentation. Uh, let your significant other know that ham radio surprise gifts can often be the wrong items. If they insist on surprises, have your significant others talk to a trusted ham friend. Give them a list of multiple items to pick from with multiple price levels. Drop unmistakable hints. See you later. Uh, shop together. Have them email me. I'll be glad to uh, help them pick out that perfect gift for you. Follow the lead of children around the world. Make a list for Santa. Leave print ads for items you want around the house, but make sure there is no confusion on the desired item. Circle, highlight, etc. Send text or emails of wanted items uh, to your significant other. You may need to provide possible vendors because you can't go down to the local uh, Walmart or uh, grocery store and pick up the, the gifts that you want. Be very careful not to use vague or over technical jargon, i.e. I want an SDR, I want an HF rig. I need slugs for my bird, and uh, I need an extended rubber duck, or I want an IC705. So when, when your significant other goes shopping for the IC705, they will quickly find these deluxe waterproof PVC reusable rain shoe covers. And I'm sure that's what you were thinking of when you were thinking of the IC705. So you should have thought a little more careful. So you sent your wife to shop at Summit Racing, I mean at the... I'm sorry, DX Engineering, but you forgot it was inside Summit Racing, and oops, you ended up with KB Pistons. And she was very happy to tell you, honey, you said it would be $12.99, but I got it for $632, so I hope you like your $705. So be more specific and uh, avoid those type of surprises. So we'll start off with some extra, one extra category that I didn't have on the list, and that's stocking stuffers. These are the things that even if you have everything you want in that great station you always can use some stocking stuffers uh, coax adapters uh, bnc plugs the double binding post to do that n fed antenna on your portable qrp radio some sma adapters to be able to to bnc or pl259 so you can use your new ht with your old antennas and always some good quality electrical tape um, because all the family borrows it anyway and takes it away and the soda antenna winders are a great way to wind antennas and, and ground radios and other wires without getting them tangled. I found these little plastic S-hook cap carabiner clips for paracord, and I ordered a thousand of them, and I sell them at HamFest. Uh, and they're really neat, but you can find the places to order them from. Some other stocking stuffers. A digital, digital uh, recorder is a great item for logging contacts while you're operating mobile or when you're doing satellite operations and your hands are all tied up. You can record the whole pass and then transcribe it later. A GPS watch with grid locator for hams. And there's a link here. This is our first link. There's a link here that tells you the, um, the uh, watches this will work on. You download the software and it'll let you display main head grid squares on your GPS enabled watch. Or just a watch with a compass if you want to spend a little bit less money, but always want to be able to find your direction. And this has an altimeter in it also. There's a number of ham apps available for phones. Some are free, but there are some that cost a small amount of money, so they make great stocking stuffers. And I have four lists of uh, various favorites here. A USB GPS dongle is a great way to keep your computer clock adjusted for WSJTX when you're operating in the field and you don't have internet access to resynchronize your time. Anderson power poles are very popular, and you can go anywhere from a whole kit of uh, connectors and crimpers and carry bag to simple to single connectors, uh, panel mounts, uh, housing covers, and distribution blocks. So there's a whole variety of uh, power pole things to stock stuffings with. Um, I always like to carry a Swiss Army knife with me, and a couple years ago I found out that there was one model that had a pair of pliers that actually had a crimper and actually had wire strippers on, a wire stripper on it, and this was the one I found was best for electronics. But you have to sacrifice the, the wine bottle corkscrew. 
So I found this year that there is another model available, the Evolution S557. It's a little more expensive, and I don't care as much for the for the panel on it, but it does include the corkscrew, and it also has pliers on it. So, uh, and it has a small wrench on it. So that might be a good idea to go. And then there's a number of multi tools, tools, and I have a link here that rates some of the best uh, multi tools out there. Uh, if you are going for the uh, Swiss Army knife, just for a few dollars extra, you can have it personalized with your name and call sign, up to 15 characters, and you can change the panels and go from the red to green, yellow, or even a translucent blue, and there's about five other colors available. So that's some small items. Now let's jump into the big items, and we'll talk a little bit about radios. And when we start talking about radios, uh, there's a whole variety of different categories, from VHF, UHF handhelds, to HF radios, and I'll talk a little bit more about individual uh, types here in the next couple slides. So here's just an example of some screenshots of various HTs. And here's some mobile FM radios. By the way, I, I, I always like the uh, the ICOM, I'm sorry, the Yaesu 9800, which is 8900, which is no longer available. And I found this TTY, it makes a fairly uh, usable uh, substitute for it. It operates very similarly. It's pretty much a clone of it. Uh, some HF radios, everything from uh, this Flex 64, uh, 6400M, uh, which you can do four, four bands at the same time with, receiving four signals at the same time. Uh, Yesu 991, the very popular ICOM 7300, uh, a brand new radio that just came out from Zygu or Saigu, however you want to pronounce it, the X6100, uh, that's a QRP radio that covers uh, 160 through 6 meters, has a built-in antenna tuner, um, the Elcraft KX2, and then the single band QCX, uh, which can be purchased as a kit or pre-built, very inexpensive, single band CW only radios, but very high performance and very nice and portable. So when you're deciding on a big ticket item, if you're shopping for that new transceiver, there's a number of resources to help you decide on the model that you want to buy. Ask your trusted friends, but especially if you can try the rigs out, but be very careful and use a grain of salt because most owners seem to like the rigs they already own. So you're almost always going to get positive responses uh, because either they don't want to admit that they made a mistake or they've gotten used to it and they like it. So be careful with um, those opinions. You can also read the reviews on eHam and the AWRL product reviews are available. I have links here to both of those. There's a wide variety of YouTube videos, which I find very useful for looking at specific features of the radios I'm investigating and actually seeing them in operation. And then the manufacturer's websites are listed in a spreadsheet that I have, and I'll go through that spreadsheet in a little while because it has some other features on it that I want to show you. There's a number of other resources. I put together two things. I put together a uh, presentation called Buying an Amateur Radio Transceiver, and you can click on the link here and go through that whole presentation. I also created a, the spreadsheet that I just mentioned a few seconds ago at tiny.cc by, by AR-SS, and I'll just open that up real quick to show you what it looks like. But it's basically um, a number of tabs at the bottom. The first tab is the HF rig matrix, and it lists radios that are currently available or have been discontinued in the last few years. And it'll show you what bands are covered, uh, different features, and approximate prices for both new and used uh, radios. One second. We may have a guest tonight, but I'm not sure yet whether they're going to show up. I just got a message for them. So um, this is the HF rig matrix. There's also a list of pretty much every HF radio for quite a while back, including a lot of discontinued models. So if you're looking in the used market, you can get some idea of this information. I have a similar matrix for VHF, UHF mobile radios. I have another list for the HTs and other uh, radios. I don't have a matrix on that particular thing. Here's the list of all the uh, VHF, UHF mobiles. A tab with manufacturer links. Uh, a link, a page with um, resellers and what radios they sell. And then a few other pages with some other information. So again, this is available at tiny.cc slash buy AR dash SS.
Uh, today I decided to put something else together. I built another spreadsheet to go along with that, and it's basically a way to get a cost estimate of how much it's going to cost to um, put together a station. And you need to make a copy of this particular one because you want to be able to edit it. And it basically has the ability to go through. You pick the tab, whether you want VHF, UHF, whether you want HF. Pick the item you want. For example, if I want a mobile radio, I pick mobile radio. And then I pick the price range. There's a high, low, and medium price range. I'm going to pick a medium range. And then I'm going to need a mobile mount for that. I'm going to pick a mobile mount, and I'm going to pick a cheap one. And I want a small uh, antenna. So I'm going to get a mobile antenna. And you'll notice what it does. It gives you a total down here of what your costs are going to be. So it's it's very helpful when you always get that question, especially when you're teaching classes or working with a new ham, how much is it going to cost me to equip my station? Uh, and I'm going to operate this in the house, so I'm going to need maybe a power supply, etc. There's one tab for VHF, UHF, and there's another tab for HF radios. And uh, going through this matrix, you can do this and get some ideas on prices. So when you're deciding on a big ticket item, uh, let's look at VHF, uh, UHF first. Probably the, the, some of the decisions you need to make first are, do you want a handheld, a mobile, or a base radio? Do you want a full featured radio or a bare bones radio? I mean, do you want a $30 HT or do you want a $400 HT is what that basically comes down to. Are you interested in analog or digital or both? Um, if you're interested in digital, which digital are you interested in? DMR, D-Star, Fusion? If you're looking for an FM radio only, or are you interested in the radio to do single sideband and CW with? What kind of features are you looking for and what kind of accessories do you need? So these are the kind of decisions you're going to make, need to make when you're doing your preliminary decisions on a VHF, UHF radio. For HF, uh, you're going to need to decide whether you want a base or portable unit, whether you want full features of bare bones. Do you want a multi-band radio or a single band radio? Uh, HF only or HF with VHF and UHF? Do you want a 100 watt radio or a QRP radio? Uh, does it have a built-in sound card for digital? Is that something you need or want? Uh, is it a tradition or computer operation? Uh, what kind of features and accessories do you want? So some of these are some of the questions that help you narrow down your choices. This is the slide. I, this is the page from the spreadsheet I showed you earlier with the vendors. And this isn't all the places you can buy radio radios. You can buy radios at very, very many places. And this is all new stuff. But these are places that give at least some uh, resemblance of support for the radios that they sell, as opposed to buying it on eBay or some unknown vendor. Smaller ticket items uh, for uh, radios could include some ham radio kits. And one of the kits might be a HF transceiver. I showed you that QRP Labs QCX Mini. Well, here's the regular version, the non-mini version. Again, it's a $55 radio. Uh, and then if you get the case, it's another $20. And uh, it's really a high-performance single-band uh, CW HF radio. Um, but you can also get kits of radios, antennas, accessories, test equipment. Uh, when you're getting kits, some kits are soldered kits that require soldering. Other kits are a matter of assembling modules. So, for example, if you buy an Elecraft KX3, you can buy it as a pre-built, or you can buy it as a kit and assemble the modules yourself. With HF transceivers, uh, here's the link for the QRP Labs uh, QCX minis. And here's a whole thing on building uh, uh, kit building for amateur radio. It's a beginner's YouTube available. Some more kit stuff on the next page. I'm sorry, missed the slide somehow. Oh, that's interesting. Well, we'll find that slide later, I guess. Um, let's move from radios to antennas. Uh, if you have an HT and you want to enhance your signal, here's three uh, extended uh, rubber duck uh, replacements. The foldable version here, uh, the one that collapses, and then this one that sort of can be tied to knots, the super elastic signal signal stick. Now, the one thing about these I think is pretty neat is you can get fluorescent colors. But the one thing I heard is when they're in very, very cold temperature, they tend to just sag. So they don't stay extended in cold temperature. So you might have a limp uh, HT antenna. If you're having trouble checking into the local or distant repeaters or interested in doing some FM simplex, it really could behoove you to put up an antenna at your house and not rely on that rubber duck in the house especially. And for not a lot of money, you can put, put and not a lot of trouble, you can put up one of these many single-band or multi-band uh, 
vertical home antennas for VHF, UHF, and I've listed uh, some of them right here with the bands that they operate on. There's pictures of them from left to right uh, that correspond with the up to down here. And you can really notice a very big improvement and very easy to put up. And this is one of the things I really strongly suggest to new hams. Get a decent antenna up at home with a short run of quality coax, and you'll be, have no problem getting into the repeater and getting into many, many more repeaters. If you're interested in operating portable or operating satellites, uh, the Aero satellite antenna or the ELK, and I'll fix that slide afterward, the ELK antenna, which is this one over here, are two antennas that you can hold in your hand and point and operate satellites or operate uh, simplex uh, UHF, VHF. Some people, you could use it for soda, POTA, etc. cetera. I, I have a whole thing on antennas, and I put this together for field day, and it's grown since then. It's a whole sheet on different types of antennas, pros and cons of different ones for portable operation. But also then it goes in and talks about a wide variety of both commercial and homebrew antennas for each of these different categories. So you can get some ideas on antennas you might want. Also support mast. Um, so here's the link for the antennas. And then I did a whole presentation to this group on portable operation a couple of weeks ago. And in that there was a lot of information on antennas for portable operation. So let's move on now to station accessories. And uh, let's talk a little bit about computer in the shack. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but it is a very, very integral part of most people's shacks nowadays and used for many things. So one of the things you might want is a new computer for Christmas or some accessories for your computer or maybe a computer program, a software program. It's a great item to ask someone to buy. It's very simple for them to get. And uh, you can have a new logging program for the new year. Some uh, things to make enhance your computer operation. This is the keyboard I'm using right now. I like click keyboards. Uh, the gaming keyboards are very nice responsive. This one lets you set different colors. Right now it's showing a rainbow view, but I just have one color across mine. Uh, I keep my shack pretty dark. So the, between the glow of the radios, the, the computer screen on the logging software, and the keyboard, I can see very well. Um, this is a suggestion from Dennis. It's a stream deck and it allows you to customize each of these little buttons and operate uh, different things on your computer and into your shack. It's also this little keypad from uh, Genovation, very similar again, can be hooked up to your radios and by pushing a single button you can have it do commands on things like the KX3, I'm sorry, the K3 here. And there's a lot of information on the stream deck and on the Genovation on these links. Um, many modern transceivers can use a dedicated external keypad to, keypad to control internal functions such as keyer memories, uh, voice recording, etc., changing bands, uh, split operation, and some of the ASUS come with FH2, some of the cheaper models do not. Um, I wrote an article in CQ Magazine a few years back in my microprocessors column on how to build these yourself because they're basically a matrix of resistors inside of there. But if you want to buy one pre-made, this is what it looks like. And I just found this neat little paddle key one here uh, on eBay. This is an inexpensive one that works very well with the ICOM 705. So this is a great little stocking stuffer, under $20. And uh, you can plug this into the 705 and operate the voice keys, the key or memories, etc. from that. Uh, this is another suggestion from Dennis. This is a... Uh, web controlled power switch so you can turn things on and off remotely and uh, it's great if you have a remote station you'll be able to switch things on and off with this let's move to another station accessory that's very dear to many hams um, morris code keys paddles and bugs come in almost an endless variety of styles features and flourishes with different feels movement styles and adjustments they can be a very personal thing there's multiple levels. Uh, they, they're, the level of functionality also is collector items or even as art. So uh, again, I would not tend to buy a surprise key for someone. I'd want to find out what their interests are and what kind of keys they like because you can spend a lot of money on some of these. And if you get the wrong one, that would be disappointing. So definitely check if you're interested in something like this, make sure you let the person that's buying the gifts know which specific ones you're interested in. Don't just say, I want a set of paddles. Um, 
there's a whole link on the CW Ops page called CW Resources. It has manufacturers of keys. There's also another li big list of key manufacturers on the DX zone. So both of these links will get you information on uh, different key manufacturers. Also information on Morris training har hardware and software, uh, electronic keyers, uh, key keyer covers and bases, uh, CW Club memberships, uh, as a gift, uh, Christmas keys, which I understand have been discontinued, but they still have 2019 and back Christmas keys available at this link. And then you can get Morris Code jewelry, everything from from uh, bracelets with beads of short and long sounds, uh, necklaces, uh, coffee uh, coffee cups. So you can get all sorts of jewelry and gifts with Morris Code on it. Uh, this, I think, also was a, a suggestion from Dennis, but I had this already in my other slideshow, so I added to this to this slideshow also. This is the Morris Reno 32. It's a multifunction open source uh, device for training. You can also use it as a keyer, uh, in a, as a decoder, and even a transceiver. So it's a uh, kit that you assemble with a microprocessor, which you can see right here, and some other components. There is some soldering required in this. But uh, it's under $100, and it makes a nice uh, learning tool for Morse code. And then you can use it even after you've done your learning as a keyer. So uh, the Morisino 32. Even though I have my clock usually gets entered into my log from my computer automatically, it's nice to have a clock in the shack that's big that you can see from a distance. And it's nice to have it on, always on exact on time. So having atomic clocks can be very helpful. Be very careful, though, if you're buying them in the domestic market as opposed to the ham radio market. Many of the atomic clocks only let you set the time zone for U.S. time zones. So they can't be set the GMT, even though they can be set for 24-hour mode. A lot of them can't be set the GMT. So make sure before you purchase a digital atomic clock uh, that it can be adjusted to the right time zone that you want in the shack. Some people like analog clocks as opposed to digital. Now, the Geochron was a mechanical device that showed the uh, basically the gray line in the illuminated and non-illuminated areas of the Earth uh, through a series of mechanical operations. That's now been replaced by a electronic version, and this is the device right here. You buy this device, and then you plug it into a 4K TV or any, key t any digital TV you want, and it basically emulates the mechanical device on a TV screen. And this is what it looked like, it's the size of a small handheld device, and you plug it into the TV. And uh, you can have a, your own Geochron without the gear sounds. Um, battery power, uh, if you're interested in batteries as a station accessory, uh, my slideshow on portable operations is a great place for information on that. You can view the slideshow or the video recording. I mentioned in that presentation that there's something called solar generator battery packs and also power delivery battery packs. On this next slide, I have an example of two so-called solar generator batteries. They're, they're called solar generators because they're designed to have a solar panel attached to them to charge them, but you can charge them in other, other ways also. And uh, they're just very, uh, I always prefer the lithium ferric phosphate. So I picked out two that I found online, just to give you examples of two. There's others out there. I just like this type of battery format. A lot of them have the lithium ion. They don't have the ferric, lithium ferric phosphate in them. And most of them have an inverter, so you can run 110, uh, 120 uh, AC devices on it. Although this one right here says it's not a very pure sine wave generator. It's a lot cheaper. The other one says it has a pure sine wave on it. So if that's a concern, you might want to be interested in that. Now, these are becoming very popular also for use for people who have CPAPs. When they're traveling or camping and they need to power their CPAP in the field, these batteries work very well. So you'll find them a lot of times advertised for that purpose. Well, both of these devices also have power delivery which is a specification that allows the USB-C port to deliver different voltages. And let's talk about that on this slide. Uh, there's a link here on power USB power delivery, PD it's called. And basically what I can do is plug in your device into that and it'll determine what voltage it is based on the device you plug in. Or you can buy these adapter cables. This particular one lets me plug into the device 
has a connector that goes to my KX2 or KX3 and it delivers 12 volts from that battery pack because it knows what that device, this uh, cord wants it to put out. You can put, provide anywhere from 5 to 20 volts with these PD battery banks. And you can charge your phone with them too if you want. But they're great for running radios and stuff in the field. Not high amperage, but for low amperage QRP type of radios. You might want a, a soft ready fine radio uh, for your station. Uh, a lot of people use them just to listen, but you can also use them to uh, provide a signal for band maps. And you can have a great band map on your computer by using SDR software, one of these SDR receivers. And then uh, you can have a as big a band map as you want, big as, big, as big a band scope as you can buy a TV size for, for your, to attach to your computer. I also have a presentation on, on online software defined radios that talks a lot about these, so you can go to that presentation. Now, many of you wish you had a contest superstation like uh, K3LR, and K3LR is about 50 miles to the east of me here, and uh, Tim's station is just fabulous, and they win multiple awards in uh, the multi-op uh, contest they operate in. And I needed a new chair last year, so I asked him what he was buying for the station because I knew he was replacing all the chairs. So I got the same exact model. So even though my station doesn't have all the antennas of K3LR, it has the same chair that I'm sitting in. So for under $100, I have the same chair, if I do, even if I don't have the same station. So either that chair you might want to get, or you can also pick out your favorite chair by visiting an office and furniture supply. The chair can be one of the most important uh, accessories for a contester because it keeps their butt in the seat, and that gets you the, the large number of contacts. Oh, and I had to get rid of the chair, my old chair, because it was digging holes in the rug. The wheels were falling off, and it was, my wife just hated it, and she was going to threaten to put it out the curb if I didn't get a new one. So let's switch gears now from station accessories to tools, including screwdrivers first here. And I like these little precision screw bits. Uh, this particular little kit is, I think, around $12 at a, a Harbor Freight. Uh, I gave these out to Christmas to all my friends and relatives a few years ago. And they're nice to have the Torx bits and all the different bit types. This set here is just bits that you need to put in a driver, but it has, this is called a security bit set. It has all the ones, so if you want to disassemble these stalls in restrooms and take off the covers of all kind of cases, these have the little holes drilled in them, as you notice right here, to let you use the Torx, even when it's a security bit. So with like 50 some bits, you can get almost anything open, even reverse threaded uh, bits in here. A set of nut drivers are handy, so instead of keep changing the sockets while you're assembling things, it's nice to reach out and grab the color-coded uh, nut driver, although one always seems to evade my bench, and it's the one I need at the time. Uh, wire st uh, side cutters uh, and wire strippers are uh, two things that wear out over time. Um, I really impressed my mother a couple years ago. She likes to do arts and crafts, and she was using some old, old... Uh, side cutters and I got her a pair of these little micro clippers and she just loved them and they were very inexpensive. That was the the best gift I got my mother in many, many years and it makes her crafting a lot easier. But there's a variety out there and these kind of tools, because they do wear out, it's nice to have a, a new one every once in a while that's sharp and still works well. Oh, my, my grandchildren always call these dinosaurs. They think these look like dinosaurs the way they have the mouth here. Uh, tools for coax work, uh, coax strippers and prep kits, uh, crimps and crimpers, um, and different types of coax strippers are available. Here's some more. These are automated ones. These are semi-automated. And again, it makes putting coax on a lot easier. Uh, soldering station. There's no reason for to have that really crappy little soldering iron. Buy a decent solder station. You can get one for 50 to 60 bucks starting price, and it really makes a big difference. Also, these usually are grounded, so you don't have to worry about static discharge from them. Or if you want to work on some of the newer things, this is a multiple uh, station here that has both a soldering iron temperature controlled. It also has a hot air, uh, air gun, and it also has a solder pump on it. So you can do all these different things, and not that expensive. There are expensive models out there if you want that you can get it but you can start off with very inexpensive models of these 
uh, magnifying lights, uh, grabbers and holders, uh, lights that you might wear on your face with magnifiers. Um, a lot of these now have LEDs in them, and I really like the LED light a lot better than the old incandescent light that was in them. One thing they don't get is warm on your forehead when you're leaning over the thing. And this one has arms on it and uh, different things. So these are some types of things. Now, what I found really useful for really small work is actually to use one of these cameras. And I have one of this, one similar to this on a stand. And you can uh, crank it right down. Now, you can use one like this with a USB port and feed it into, a, into your uh, computing device or, or tablet or whatever. But these have their own built-in screen. So they're very easy to use. Uh, let's talk about some personalized items. If you don't have QSL cards, it's a great time to uh, get some personalized QSL cards. And I have a list of QSL printers and vendors here. And I even have a link on my QSL cards here for the vendor that I used, which was uh, ux5oqsl.com. And again, you can click on that and it'll bring up his site. And very, very reasonably priced color cards. And uh, you might also want to consider uh, getting some inexpensive business cards for eyeball contacts. A lot of people can use the same art that you use for your original QSL card and make um, little business cards for you. There's a ton of personalized apparel out there. And because it's just a matter of engraving or stitching, a lot of these things are available on all different types of things from ham dealers and non-ham dealers alike. There's people that specialize in this type of thing. You can get shirts, hats, name badges with your call sign on it. You might consider getting call sign license plates if you don't already have them. Some states cost a little bit of money, a lot more money. Some states are just a little bit money. Some places, there's no extra charge for these. So you need to check in on your state and see what's involved in getting one. Ohio has this bizarre rule that you have to bring a paper copy of your license, which of course we don't have anymore. So you got to print out the copy from the FCC and bring it in and show it to them, even when you're renewing your license every year for some strange reason. You can also get a number of plaques. I have a plaque similar to this that has my call sign on it in the shack here um, that glows real nicely. And I, it's very nice. It's just sits on the wall and has an LED light in it. This one here, can, you can control the colors and the, the intensity of it uh, with this little remote control. You can also get wooden plaques, uh, get metal engraved, uh, metal or engraving. So there's a wide variety of plaques available or uh, call sign uh, name, name uh, accessories. Now, you might want to think about a membership or a subscription. Uh, an AW or all membership or even a life membership, which is a lot more hefty in price, uh, or if you're Canadian, the RAC, um, or a membership in a national or local radio club. And another area might be ask someone for a small gift to pay for membership in something like the QRP, ARCI, GQRP club, or one of the other clubs, AMSAT, the Long Island CW club. Um, and there's also a list right here of other CW clubs uh, that you might want to join. Um, magazine subscriptions, the AWRL membership includes a subscription to either QST or On the Air magazine. Uh, you can choose either one to be mailed to you in paper form. But now, with no extra charge, when you're, once you're a member, you can view all of these online and read all the magazines if, that you want online, but only get one mailed to you. CQ Magazine, I write a quarterly column in that. My new column that I just switched over from the microprocessor column to the new column, which is called Ham Radio Explorer, should be in the December issue. Oh, soup, I forgot one thing. You might also want subscriptions to services. Uh, there's an annual cost if you want a subscription to QRZ or EQSL or EHAM. Uh, Clublog doesn't require you to pay anything, but you can do a donation to them and be a sponsoring member. So let's look at some test equipment. Uh, digital multimeters are a necessity for almost everything you do around electronics and in the Radio Shack. And you can go anywhere from a small $5 one to, you can get a very decent one for $5. Now you can go up to a lab grade for a couple hundred dollars, but I find for everything I need in the Shack, a, a $50 
meter does just about everything I needed to do. One of the things I really suggest is when you're getting one, it's very preferable if it's one that has a continuity tester that has an audio tone. This particular little cheap one here does not have that. And that makes it for me not as useful because I want to be able to not have to look over and see whether the meter's changing. I just want to be able to touch the spots and hear whether I have continuity. Uh, another piece of test equipment uh, that is very helpful, especially if you don't have one at all in your shack, is a power meter, SWR meter. Now, the power meter function is approximate at best on these less expensive meters. If you want to get accurate power measurements, you're going to spend a lot more money than you are for these. But these are 10 to 15 percent. And if you find one that matches the range of the power you use, so in other words, if you're operating QRP, get one that only goes up to 15 watts, your accuracy will be a lot better than if you try and read that low power on one that has a 100 watt scale on it. So picking a meter that matches your power level can be very helpful. The SWR meter is usually more accurate when measuring SWR because SWR is a relative and not an absolute measurement. But this little one is a combination SWR uh, watt meter, and the prices range from $80 to about $250. You can get a very decent one for low hundreds. This particular one uh, also does, uh, let's see, is this the one or not? I'm not sure. One of them does VH, uh, two meters VHF also on it, in addition to HF. A very popular new test piece of equipment is something called the Nano VNA. And the nice thing is they're very inexpensive. And somehow I ended up with the price on top of it here. But you can pick one of these up for about $50 to $150, depending on what you're getting and what accessories come with it. And this, this vector network analyzers uh, allow you to measure antenna or coax parameters, SWR, impedance, and loss. They let you characterize and tune filters. They're very useful if you're building and tuning homemade antennas, filters, or other RF circuits. And uh, there's an article, there's a video by the Smoking Ape on his uh, podcast, What Nano VNA Should I Buy, that you might find useful. And again, as I said, $50 to $150. Something that doesn't seem like it should work actually works fairly well, uh, at least at the uh, the level that I need, and that's these little uh, imported ESR, LCR, they're often called TR4 meter transistor tester, diode tester. They have many, many different names, but what ba they basically do is they allow you to measure inductance, capacitance, how did I get that weird character? Uh, didn't like the character I used, evidently. Uh, resistance. And that's where the LCR comes from, and uh, reactants also. Uh, they identify and characterize transistors, diodes, FETs, etc. So if you have some unknown uh, semiconductors, you can plug them in here and see what leads are what and what type of device it is. So this is saying it's a triac. Uh, you identify as a FET or a transistor. It'll tell you which is which, which terminal is which, and it'll even give you some uh, rudimentary measurements of the performance of these various devices. There's supposed to be a link here, I'll fix that. So another mis miscellaneous item is books. And uh, each of these books has a link on it so you can click on the book itself. One of my favorite um, AWRL books is not so much the handbook, which is a great, the handbook is great, but it's somewhat overwhelming, I think, often for newcomers, and I find the operating manual is a good book uh, for someone just starting out, but of course the handbook has a lot of great information in it. Um, there's a newer book about two years old called Amateur Contesting for Beginners, and it really does start at the beginning level. It's by Doug Grant, K1DG, and it's a very good book. Ward Silver writes Ham Radio for dummies and a lot of people say negative things about the dummy books this is a great book even if you're an experienced amateur radio operator there's stuff you can learn in there ward's a great author uh and this is an example of a piece of work that i think he enjoys writing because it's, it's very it's written in a very friendly style and very approachable by the way ward is also the editor of the handbook but um he writes this uh ham radio for dummies and it just came out with a new edition um the Antenna Book from the AWRL. Um, I picked some other lesser known authors. K4II, K4IA has something called DX the Easy Way. Uh, Grounding and Bonding is another Ward Silver book from the AWRL. 
The uh, Radio Today's Guide, I'm going to click on that one for, link for a minute because this is uh, Andrew Barron from New Zealand who spoke to our local club via Zoom. He has books on a wide variety of radios, especially the ICOMs, but he also has some Yesu books and other books out there. And uh, his latest book is on the ICOM 705. So these books are very well written and uh, they're not very expensive at all, especially if you're buying the Kindle versions of them. Uh, 99 things you can do with amateur radio, uh, dial dancing, which is a very interesting uh, book. It's very written in a very friendly style by D Don Keith and 4 kc One of the books that I really cut my teeth on, this is the third edition. I started with the first edition by Bob Walker, uh, W9 KNI, The Complete DXer. This book is a little outdated now because it's about 20 years old, and he actually has a book that came out since then. Uh, it's also a little bit dated. It's is called A Year of DX, where he talks about working the DX marathon. These are great books for the philosophy of how to work DX, how to think through the process of chasing down that rare DX and uh, listening for it and how to actually make the context. I really strongly recommend that. And I picked one up at the Dayton, at the Orlando Hamcation uh, two years ago in the flea market that actually had uh, was signed by Bob inside of it. I picked it up for a buck in the in the flea market. And then finally, the last one down here in the corner is by an author who's passed away, unfortunately. Fred Cady, KE7X, wrote a series of books on the Ellacraft KX2, the KX3, the K3, and they really, really give you a lot of good information. And the books are available at the Ellacraft site, so if you click on that, you can get the different books. Even though um, a lot of my maps are online, it's great to have maps that decorate the shack, and I like this word, this world map a little bit better than the AWRO world map. I actually cut the bottom off of it so I had more room to put it on the wall. Um, I also very much like this European map, uh, this radio map of Europe with the grid squares on it. Um, but then the, my favorite AWRO map is the North American one with the grid squares in the States and the Latin American countries on it. And then the, the, up in the upper right-hand corner, we have E1, EI8IC. He does something called the Gro Global Overlay Mapper. Now, there's a number of maps on his website that you can go to and use, but then you can also purchase this Global Overlay Mapper, which functions on your computer without being connected to the Internet. And the reason why it's called an overlay, you can click on these little buttons and say you want to see the CQ zones or the ITU zones or the or the country borders or the prefixes and you can just turn all that on and off so they make really nice maps and on countries some of the countries you can zoom in on the country and it'll show you not only the prefix for the country but the prefixes for different sections of the country uh, i have a whole web page with information on maps and charts that you can go to and again this link will take you to these particular maps or sites and here's the global overlay map from eic E-I-8-I-C, and you can actually see some of the maps that are on his site just by going there and taking a look at them. So you can also use the website maps if you're not interested in buying the global overlay, but it's not that expensive and it really works nicely. A lot of us have a lot of QSL cards and sometimes it becomes difficult to display them. Uh, so it, I scanned a lot of my QSL cards and then I can display them on an inexpensive TV that I mounted in the shack. Uh, or you could also buy one of those uh, dedicated uh, digital picture frames, but it was actually cheaper to buy the TV and just to hook it up to the computer and run a piece of software and it just cycles through them. And I always have that on when we're having, uh, when I'm entertaining at the house here so I can show QSL cards that are, you know, two foot wide as opposed to the little tiny cards. Now, this is something that I found at a ham fest, and I'm putting this in here not because I'm su suggesting you buy it, although if you do find it, buy it, but I cannot find this. So I'm going to show you where it is, but you might go on a go wild goose hunt trying to find it. It basically is a piece of wood that you can see right here, and it has these rods coming out of there and then the QSL hangers. Each one holds 40 QSL cards and there's 10 of them and you can flip the, through these so you can see different cards on the wall. So I can have 400 Q, QSL cards on my wall and I can flip through them. I have never been able to find one after I found this at a ham fest. So if anyone finds this, let me know where you found it and how to order more because I'd love to have another one. It's Every time someone comes to visit my shack, they comment on it and I don't know where to find another one.
One of the things you might do is not buy something, but instead go for an experience. Uh, ham travel might be the gift you might, if you've never been to the Dayton Ham Vention, um, talk to your significant other about maybe funding a vacation. Uh, the tickets to the convention itself are not that expensive, but travel and the rooms may be a little bit of money. The Orlando Hamcation is another great place. It's coming up in just a few months in February. My wife and I went down there two years ago. Um, and then if not one of the big national ham fests, think about a regional one, a convention or ham fest. There's also a couple other national or semi-national ham conventions like, like Huntsville in uh, August. Um, so think about maybe traveling overnight and spending a few dollars on a hotel room and a couple meals and support your regional ham fest. You might also want to consider a DX or multiplier vacation, as I call it. Um, go to a Caribbean island. Uh, don't forget U.S., Puerto Rico, and, and, and Virgin Islands when you're thinking about the Caribbean. You don't have to do anything special to operate there as far as your license goes. Or if you're interested in IOTAs, uh, you can find islands around the world to go to. Or maybe you want to drive and uh, go to some rare VE provinces, U.S. states during the AWRL sweepstakes or other contests. Um, Maybe rent an amateur amateur radio con cottage. This one right here you can rent in Finland, and it's called the uh, the Elk Lodge. And it looks fabulous. It's on this island in Finland. Or you might want a staycation, rent airtime on a remote station and operate from your home. If you don't have a great contesting station and you want to feel what it's like to operate from uh, the coast of Maine and how, how you can, all those Europeans rush in, you can rent some hours on a contest station. Um, as far as ham radio travel, my wife and I uh, try and spend our field day as a short vacation and we go to different states and we try to go to a rare section. We, so we spend a lot of time in places like West Virginia, Delaware, Maine, Vermont, Montana and uh, I have a whole presentation on it and the nice thing about this presentation is you don't have to listen to just me my wife Linda actually is one of the presenters on this and you can watch the video when we presented to a club um, this last year but uh, we combined the two and we just did another Amtrak trip and squeeze some radio operating in on that let's talk now about uh, that budding potential ham, whether they're a youngster or maybe even a little bit older, but someone that's just thinking about getting into the hobby and they're not really sure if amateur radio is something they're interested in. So one of the things that I got started with, and I'm sure many, many, many of you did, and that is crystal radios. And uh, I remember building a crystal radio with a speaker I stole from an old telephone and uh, some other things. But you can pick up a small kit of parts for a crystal radio here that can give you a really decent operating crystal radio. There's also the Crystal Radio Society and Midnight Science Books, which is one group, and they have both kits and publications on this type of thing. Uh, simple electronic kits, there's thousands of them out there available on eBay uh, that you can use and uh, very easy to use. And uh, these are good places to start out for a youngster. And Linda, feel free to jump in if you want to. My I, my my significant other and gift buyer jumped in there, it's, uh, Linda. Um, I have a link here called Four Tips for Ki uh, Teaching Kids How to Build Electronics. Uh, that It's free to go to this link, but there's a gentleman that did this link that has a book, which I'll show you in a few minutes here, that I think is very good. I also have a thing on building Morris code keys uh, using clothespins, and it's called the $2 clothespin Morris key, and you can go there and find out how to do that. Walkie Talkies, uh, Family Radio Service HTs are a great way to get kids an opportunity to try out radio without having to get their license. Uh, you might want to think about providing them with a key code oscillator. And if they're interested, get them started with the Long Island CW Kids Morris classes. They're free uh, and great way to learn Morris code. Next thing you might want to think about for budding uh, ham is an Arduino or microprocessor project kit with books and all the components to be able to assemble these different projects. And they're great for seasoned hams also. If you've never played around with uh, Arduinos or Raspberry Pis or any other microprocessor devices, for, for $30 to $40, you can pick up a fabulous kit of things and build stuff and learn how to do uh, this. The programming is not that hard 
And if you can copy and paste, you can do some of the programming for these. So that's something I'd really consider. So some books for youngsters. Um, if in the fiction area, Ada Lace is a great book uh, by Emily, Emily Calendrelli. And uh, it's very science oriented and also very space oriented. Uh, Radio Rescue is a very interesting book about a, a, a youngster who learns Morse code. Um, the Electronics for Kids is a dummies book. And then the one that I was talking about earlier, that website on Electronics for Kids, this, I, I ordered one of these this, this morning for my grandson. Uh, it was nice because there was a sample chapter I was able to go through here. And when I looked at the sample chapter, it really sold me. He has a lot of stuff on very practical kits it's very sound uh theory wise but it's a lot of fun things that i did when i was a kid like making the um magnet magnet and uh lemon uh batteries and all that sort of thing so this was a very interesting book that i picked up for my grandson today i also have a link they're free but the zach and max comic books i have a link there that you can share and if you really think they're interested in getting started a, a tech license manual might be something to do. And I have a big asterisk here because the problem is there's not a decent one written for youngsters. I've not found one. So if someone knows of a great one that's written for youngsters or would like to write one for youngsters, that would be a great thing to have. And the number one gift for youngsters interested in amateur radio is spend quality time with them. Teach them to solder using simple kits. Do electronics, electricity, magnetics, robotics, microprocessor, et cetera, et cetera, experiments and projects with them. Teach them how to tune in stations using your radio and antenna. Then send them home with instructions on how to use free online SDRs to tune in hams and SWLs with no radio antenna necessary. And I have a link here on a little uh, instruction sheet on how to do that and then again my presentation on on online software defined radios if they don't live near you and you can't do this in person think about doing it via zoom or google meet with nothing else the pandemic has taught us that we can do things without being in the same location but again that's probably the most important gift you can do is not just giving them things but spending time with them and teaching them the things you've learned one of the things i suggest is that as a gift, you give a gift of giving back to the ham community. Consider donating unused equipment to your local club, school club, et cetera, to be used by new hams or resold to fund club projects. Sponsor a young hams visit to the contest university or a DX convention or DX expedition. There's various groups out there that you don't have to pay for the whole thing. You can contribute portions of the cost to be able to send uh, youngsters on these trips. Support online ham services like Clublog. They take donations, as do many other uh, nonprofit type of organizations out there. Serve your local club as an officer. Do presentations for local clubs or Rat Pack, or reach uh, out to clubs worldwide. Write a newsletter article for your local news news club editor. I'm sure they'd love to hear from you with a article that's the demand I hear all the time. So we came to the end of my list, and what I'd like to do now is I'd like to have you all share, but we're going to wait a second. I'm going to just run through a couple slides, and we'll come back to this one. So again, I want to remind you how to get to the links to get all this information, tiny.cc slash ARGIFTS will get you there, and the links to the uh, Buy Amateur Radio Transceivers, the spreadsheet, and the station cost estimator are all here also. Uh, my contact information is on the next slide and a link to all my other presentations of it is available on this slide. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to back up to this slide and I'm going to uh, stop the screen share here in a moment and I'm going to take uh, your suggestions, your questions, your comments, and your complaints. And if you want to order anything, you have to talk to Dan though because he's he's the one buying tonight. So let me stop the share. You might want to put the link uh, to your. Uh, yes, I will put it in the chat. Super, thank you. So while I'm typing that in the chat, uh, 
any questions or suggestions and definitely any gifts that you did not see tonight that you would like to get or you have gotten or given in the past. Do you want me to hop in here, Anthony? Yes, go right ahead. Uh, hi, I'm Linda K. ODP, uh, Anthony's <laughs> wife. Just wanted to say that I had no idea we owned a lot of this stuff. So <laughs> this was very informative for me tonight. <laughs> Anthony really likes to keep his ham radio gear in a constant state of flux. Like it's all around the house and it just keeps coming and going. So I really have no way to tell what he has. <laughs> so it's nice to see everyone tonight. Well, it's nice meeting you. We hear about you a lot. This is the first time we got to get to put a face to the name. Well, if, if any club, if any of you need a club presentation and you want Linda and I's amateur radio trains and travel, I can, we can get her to present to you and, and you get a good presentation when she does it. So questions about any of the gifts I talked about, suggestions. Yes, uh, Dennis just put it something in here. One of the things I mentioned is I talked about Arduino projects and kits, and it does say books, but I didn't list his particular book. So, Dennis, why don't you send that out to everyone so they get that in the chat? Uh, Jack Purdom, Purdom and uh, and Dennis wrote a book called Arduino Projects for Amateur Radio, which is a great uh, book. I didn't get a chance to add it on that slide, but I did. I did mention books on that slide, and that's what I was thinking of. Oh, then for those of you that weren't here earlier, I'll put the hat back on for a second. I had a special hat for tonight with the reindeer on it. <laughs> they all must have been bad and they're all expecting cold this year because no one's saying anything. What's well, the presentation is really good, far, far above anything I, my expectations. It was great. Yeah, I, I thought it was great, but I think he's forgetting about our uh, clog up at the uh, harbor. That's why we're not saying much. You know, the funny thing is, I everything I've ordered in the last couple of months, I've had no problem getting. Um, it's sort of weird, I guess, because I didn't really need it badly, so it came immediately. <laughs> But there is a problem with the electronics end of things right now. So yes, it is it is a slight <laughs> problem. Well, we're being awful quiet. Uh, it has been a, a great presentation. I think we're going to get a lot of viewers uh, looking at it on YouTube and uh, our other channels out there. Uh, we had a pretty good show tonight. It was, what, 36 at one point, and uh, I'm sure everybody enjoyed it. Uh, Char, the, on the watch, what's, what's interesting is you get the watch, and then you download the software for free. So the link in that uh, thing on the GPS watches, when you click on that link, it'll tell you the, the, the link actually takes you to the software, and then you can see which models are included with that, 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 that software functions on. And you can buy models that don't require it to be a that don't require a phone, so it's it can be an independent watch because there's nothing worse than being out in the field trying to do GPS and then lose your phone signal. And if it's a smart watch, it depends on a phone; it won't function then. Diana has her hands up again. Yes, I see that. I just get rid of call her. Go ahead, Diana. Hi, I just wanted to thank Anthony. Not only was that fun and really interesting, and uh, and gave me a lot of uh, n sometimes new information about new things that I might be interested in. But the charts that you did were a gift in themselves and something that I know, is, especially working with new hams, um, totally invaluable. So thank you, Anthony, for all of the gifts within the presentation about gifts. 
Well, you're very welcome. And it, please try out that at, that sheet and see what everyone thinks. If they if I need to make some changes, and then I can always do that. So, yeah, definitely take a look. I just put that together this afternoon. That uh, cost estimator sheet. Absolutely amazing the tools that you've come up and for all of us. Very, very valuable tools. Knowing this presentation, but others and other things you do for us. Appreciate you, sir. Well, well, one thing I didn't add on there, something that I, I want to mention, if you don't have a foot switch, I, I always like to contest with foot switches with a headset, even when I'm operating in the field. And I found that I, I found a very inexpensive and small portable field usable foot switch. And what I did is I searched, just search on eBay for tattoo machine switches. And it's just a little tiny one, very simple and uh, was very inexpensive. I don't like the switches that require like a, a full five pound push on them to do that. It sort of tires your foot out. And this one's real nice. Okay, I, I'm i looking for hands. How are we doing in the chat there, Barry? We're good. Well, we might be wrapping this baby up. It's been a great presentation. Um, and I, like I say, there's going to be a lot of people following up on this, watching it through the, uh, our outlets and such. So uh, looking for any more comments, suggestions? That was a wonderful presentation, Anthony. Really loved it. Great job. Thank you. Did Lisa get her list out? I didn't see any notebook in her hand. She has uh, a, a she has a memory for this stuff, and she does that every year. <laughs> she has already ordered my gift. She didn't realize when I ordered it, though. But I do have a I do have one of these one of the one of the radios I showed tonight is on my uh, has been ordered already. It's supposed to come before December. We'll see whether it gets here or not. Yeah, one of the things that I do, too, is Anthony's mother always still wants to buy him a Christmas present. So usually I'll pick something off of the list or he'll buy it. And she always says on Christmas morning, oh, what did I get you? And then usually when he shows her, she's like, what does that do? Now, luckily, I have a, a nephew who became a ham a few years ago. So I can I, I go down and shop in the in my storage of my basement and then give him gifts from there. So he gets used items, but uh, things he can definitely use. Okay. Well, uh, I think we're going to have to start wrapping this up. Anthony, it's been a great presentation. Super one. We'll get the we'll get this uh, uh, presentation out with all the links in it, so everybody can uh, enjoy clicking on that. That's going to be a hobby all by itself. Just going through all your links and everything it has to offer. Well, with this in mind, uh, I shall say 73s. Again, you can all call, you all can just jump back in here after I close it down and just chit chat. What, one, yeah. one, one quick thing, Dan, just a reminder for everyone, we do not meet next Wednesday. That is true. Next Wednesday, next, we have some holidays there and we're going to take some holiday time off. So Wednesday and Thursday next week, no sessions. Yes. Yes. I'll have to get some stuff out there on that. Make sure nobody's nobody's looking for us all righty well with that any more any more comments announcements you name it just bring it on okay going once going twice 73s everyone have a very good and uh, a, a very good uh, afternoon what's left of it and see you next go around seven three all we'll see you tomorrow night seven threes everybody thank you for coming Ho, ho, ho. <laughs>